Michael Bambrick was born in England in 1952 to Irish parents. There were six in the family, three sisters, who he never met and two older brothers. When he was five, he moved with his family to Ireland. While his two older brothers worked hard and found their path in life, the same couldn't be said for Michael. He was a very angry child and thought nothing of attacking his mother, leaving her bruised and battered on many occasions. Michael, as he got older and finished school, he never had steady employment and it was said that his temper would be a factor in being able to hold down a job. In 1974, he enlisted in the Irish Army, but went AWOL two months into his training. He stayed with his parents for the next two years, hardly leaving the house. He turned himself into the military police eventually, and he was returned to the army barracks, and again he went AWOL that very night. Michael didn't leave because he had other aspirations in life. He just didn't want to do anything, and his parents facilitated this by letting him stay in bed all day, or if he wasn't in bed, he'd sit in front of the TV. Basically, he was a bit of a waster, as we'd say here in Ireland. Before he joined the army in 1972, he married a woman named Marie Hayes, and they had a son together. The marriage didn't last long at all, as Michael refused to get a job, and in a more intimate nature, Marie discovered that he liked to wear women's clothes. In 1974, in old Catholic Ireland, this was beyond taboo. Marie asked him to stop and he did try, even going to therapy. But like anything Michael started, he didn't continue with the therapy. But things would take a dark turn within the marriage. Michael would awake one night, dressed in women's clothes, and proceed to put a pair of tights around Marie's head, gagging her and pinning her down. Marie blacked out and when she awoke, Michael graped her. After this incident, Marie fled the family home. Michael returned to his parents' home when Marie left with their son. Michael continued to live with his parents until their deaths. He then moved out after selling the family home and he moved to St. Teresa's Gardens Flats in Dublin's south inner city. This is when he would meet Patricia McGauley. Patricia was born in Dublin in September 1948. She had two sisters and a brother and grew up just off Capel Street in Dublin's Market District. Patricia, after leaving school in 1963, worked several jobs in factories, which were common at the time. Here, in one of these factories, she would meet and marry John McGauley in 1976. But the marriage was not a happy one and was over just after two years. They both drank too much and argued often. Patricia was very close with her mother and when the marriage to John ended, she moved back in with her. It was in 1982 that she met Michael. She moved in with him after a short while and in 1984 they had their first child together, a little girl, Adriana. As their family grew, they applied to Dublin Corporation to be rehoused and so they moved to St. Ronan's Park in Clondalkin in Dublin. In 1990, Patricia had another child with Michael, a little girl, Louise. Because having her two little girls, Patricia had cut back on her drinking prioritising raising her girls the best she could. Michael, on the other hand, did not feel the same way as Patricia. On Wednesday, the 11th of September 1991, Michael and Patricia went out for a drink. They left the two girls with Patricia's mother. When the evening was over, they collected the two little girls and headed home. The next day, Thursday the 12th, Patricia's mother was expecting her to call as she always collected her single parents allowance for her. Just a side note on the single parents allowance here in Ireland. One of the rules of single or lone parents allowance was you had to be living alone with your children. It wasn't regulated very well and so many had a live-in partner and the social welfare offices didn't keep tabs very well. And usually they didn't find out unless you were reported by someone, that is a neighbour. But because of the area, most were doing this. And so by reporting someone, you were only drawing attention onto yourself. So Manny got away with it. So instead of Patricia turning up to her mother's house, Michael turned up to collect the payment and the two girls who usually went there after school. On Friday the 13th of September, Michael would say that Patricia had left the house at around 8.30pm the night before on the 12th after another row and that she was heading to her mother's. But her mother would say she never turned up. So by Sunday the 15th of September, 
Michael went to the local Garda station to report Patricia missing. He told Gardy that Patricia had left the house and gave a description of what she was wearing. Gardy took the report and began a missing person case investigation. Neighbours said that she kept herself to herself and didn't really know her, but knew that her and Michael had an explosive relationship and could often be heard fighting. They also reported that on the Wednesday night of the 11th, a ferocious row was heard, with a lot of screaming and shouting, but eventually it went quiet and nothing more was thought of it. The next morning, the neighbour next door reported seeing Patricia passing her house wearing the clothes that Michael had said she was wearing when he last saw her. But was it Patricia or someone dressed up in Patricia's clothes? A year later, in 1992, another woman would go missing. Her name was Mary Cummins and she was from the Liberties. The Liberties is an area in central Dublin and located southwest of the inner city. Here you will find a Guinness Brewery, whiskey distilling and historically the textile industry and tenement housing. Mary was a single mother and in 1992 had a five-year-old daughter. She was reported missing by a friend and neighbour on the 24th of July of that same year. The day before she had collected her single parents allowance and gone shopping. Mary was born in December 1956 and spent her first four years of her life in an orphanage. Her mother was a teen when she got pregnant and because she had no support she had no choice but place Mary in a home. Mary was eventually placed with the family on the South Circular Road in Dublin. She would grow up with another adoptive sister who was practically a twin as there was only four months between them. Their adoptive mother dressed them the same and they grew up very close, especially as their adoptive father drank heavily and would often beat their mother. When the two girls were 15, their adoptive mother passed away from cancer and five years later their adoptive father passed away from a massive heart attack. Soon after, Mary would meet a man and she would be with him for six years. They lived in a house in Finglas. He was a married man that was separated from his wife and so he and Mary never married, as he was not free to, and divorce was not legal at that time. Mary and this man would go on to have three children, and it was an abusive relationship. But in 1984, this man would pass away, and he would leave proceeds to part of the sale of his house to Mary, so I guess he wasn't all bad. But within months of receiving this money, she had spent it and was broke. Mary could not find any stability in her life, and she became homeless, which eventually led to her three children being taken into care. But within a few years, Mary seemed to find her feet. She moved into a flat in the Liberties in Dublin. She became friendly with one of her neighbours and soon they began dating. His name was Luke and they would go on to have a little girl named Samantha. On the day Mary went missing was the one day a week where she would collect her single parents allowance. She would have money in her pocket and she saw it as a day where she would treat herself. She would spend the day in pubs around the city. Mary would bring her daughter Samantha with her and this would not be an uncommon occurrence back in those days. One of the pubs she went to, Samantha met another little girl that was there with her dad and as soon as the little girls began playing together, the parents began hitting it off and spent the evening together chatting. The friends that Mary was with soon offered to bring little Samantha to their home and look after her while she went on with her night in the pub and Mary gratefully accepted. When her friends left with little Samantha, it would be the last time they would ever see her again. The next day, on the 25th of July 1992, Mary never arrived at her friend's house to pick up Samantha, and when Luke called to her flat, he noticed that none of her shopping had been put away from the day before. On the 26th of July, Mary was reported missing to the Gardaí. The Gardaí tracked down the man that Mary had been with in the pub on the Thursday and he told them that they parted ways after leaving the pub. Mary's name was added to the list of missing women that were going missing in the Leinster area, which would go on to be dubbed the Vanishing Triangle. As the years passed, a more public and political pressure was put on the Gardaí to make a connection to all the missing women. Reviewing two of the missing women, Mary and Patricia, one name came up that was in common to both missing women, Michael Bambrick. Patricia was his ex and Mary had been with him in the pub the night she went missing. Then in 1994, a young girl aged 12 
named Adriana, walked into the guard station and made allegations against her father that she was being abused by him and his name was Michael Bambrick. She had been locked in the garden shed, kept out of the kitchen, denied food and beaten. He even killed her pets over something trivial. She also spoke of seeing Mary Cummins at her house the night she went missing. She spoke of playing with Mary's daughter in the pub and how they had gone back to the house after the pub. Her father dropped her at her minders and when she was returned home later, Mary was still there. But when she awoke the next morning, Mary was gone, but her running shoes weren't. Adriana then recalled how later that day, her father had burned the shoes to get rid of them. The Gardaí involved the CPS and they visited the house and to them it confirmed that Adriana was telling the truth. The CPS determined that Adriana was not living in a safe and clean house and she was removed to go live with her sister. In January 1995, Bambrick was arrested on five charges of sexually assaulting a minor, which was his daughter Adriana. The Gardaí couldn't get a search warrant for the house to gather evidence as Bambrick had sublet the property and the tenants wouldn't let them do a search. Back then, Irish law didn't cover search warrants under these circumstances. After Bambrick moved out of the house, he went into a hostel and here he would meet a new woman, Stella Mooney. She was a young mother of two and by the time of his arrest in January 1995, she was pregnant for him. The council found them a house in the same area as he had lived with Patricia only a few years before. The neighbours were not happy to see him back. They remembered him from years ago when he lived there and they kept a close eye on him. They would say he was a weirdo and known to steal women's clothes off the neighbours' washing lines. Not only was it creepy, but the neighbours couldn't afford to be replacing the items he stole, so they would keep an eye out on their washing when he was about. Even gathering and shouting, not today Josephine, not today, which is a little saying we have here in Ireland, adapted from not tonight Josephine, not tonight which was a saying by Napoleon when declining sex with Empress Josephine, which I didn't know. The residents eventually became incensed by Bambrick's presence and began protests in order to have him kicked out, and it worked. He and Stella were moved to another area, and again with word getting out about him, they were moved on again. Meanwhile, Gardy kept surveillance on him, such was the threat he imposed. They could not get enough evidence on him to charge him, so they decided to approach Stella and tell her of the danger she may be in. Meanwhile, the family that had been living in Bamberg's old house moved out and the corporation gave them permission to search the house. In 1995, Gardy decided to dig up the garden of the house as they strongly felt there was a body or bodies buried there, but nothing was found. In May of 1995, forensics were done on the interior of the house and blood was found when the floorboards were lifted and examined. In June 1995, Bambrick was finally arrested and held and questioned about the disappearance of Patricia and Mary. On the 13th hour, Bambrick confessed to killing both women and told them what had happened, how he disposed of their bodies and where they could be found. He described what happened to Patricia first. He said he and Patricia had been out that night and on the way home they argued as Patricia wanted to collect the children from her mother's house, with Bambrick eventually giving in and collecting the children. They fought again when they got home, as Patricia had no cigarettes and wanted him to go get her some. Eventually things calmed when Bambrick found a single cigarette in the house. They went to bed and had sex. He said he tied her up and Patricia started gasping and turning blue. He stated that sometimes Patricia liked this type of bondage, but other times she didn't. When Patricia was dying, he said he went to get scissors to cut the tights from around her head, but when he returned to the bedroom, she was dead. He also stated that he was wearing Patricia's underwear and clothes while performing sex. He moved Patricia's body to the box room in the house and went to sleep. The next morning, he got up and brought the children to school, went to his false placement as the caretaker, went to Patricia's mother's to collect the children and Patricia's social welfare payment. The following day was when he finally contemplated what to do with Patricia's body. While the two girls were at school, he decided to cut up her body. He placed each part in plastic bags. That night, he made several trips by bicycle to a local dumping ground and buried Patricia in shallow holes. The dumping ground was just a 10 minute cycle from their home. Next, he described how he had met Mary Cummins 
when he was out with his daughter in a pub, how the two girls got on playing together, which was an opportunity to chat up Mary. He invited Mary back to the house. First they went back to Mary's house and dropped off groceries that Mary had bought that day. Then they got a taxi and dropped off Adriana to the childminders and went on a pub crawl. When closing time came, they both made their way to Bambrick's house. The childminder brought Adriana home and she went to bed. Things then progressed between Bambrick and Mary in a sexual way. He said Mary allowed him to tie her up with the gag rolled in her mouth and her hands tied behind her back. The next thing he knew, she was dead. Again, Bambrick moved the body into the box room and cut up her body, putting her into bags, as he had done with Patricia. This time he used a wheelbarrow to move the body parts and dumped them in some nearby brush near a school. It is reported that Bambrick said, quote, He was glad to have their deaths off his conscience and he was glad that the two women would have a decent burial now. He also said that he knew he had killed Patricia and Mary, but that he didn't set out to do it. I want to tell Adriana that I am sorry for what I have done and I love her a lot. Louise, his other daughter, was too young to understand. I hope they have a good life. The Gardaí searched the two sites and they were less than half a mile apart. Patricia was the first to be found and then Mary. The recovery took three days and the state pathologist was brought in and forensics was done to confirm they were indeed the bodies of Patricia and Mary. Gardaí in their investigation also spoke to the women that were known to have crossed Bambrick's path, including his ex-wife and Stella, his current girlfriend. In October 1995, Bambrick appeared in court and was charged with the murders and remanded in custody as he did not apply for bail. He was homeless, so I guess he saw it as having a roof over his head and three square meals a day. He was also granted free legal aid as he was not working at the time. Bambrick pleaded not guilty and felt the deaths were not intentional and therefore not murder. While being interviewed by Gardaí, he did admit that he caused the deaths by engaging in sexual acts, but he maintained it was an accident in each case. It was pointed out to him that he didn't act like someone that caused an accident. In fact, he did everything to cover up the deaths, not calling for help, cutting up the bodies, hiding the bodies, and most of all, carrying on with his life like nothing had happened. On May the 3rd, 1996, Bambrick finally got his day in court. The trial was held at the four courts in Dublin. He pleaded not guilty again to murder, but pleaded guilty to manslaughter on both accounts. The DPP accepted this plea and stated that there would be no need for a trial. Before sentencing in July of 1996, Bambrick's previous convictions were read to Justice Paul Carney, six in total. One was for indecent assault on a woman in 1974, after his marriage had broken down and this woman pressed charges, and he served nine months. The other five convictions were for larceny, which was for Bambrick stealing women's underwear. Patricia and Mary's families sat in the court while what happened to their loved ones was read out to the judge. They wept when they heard what they had gone through. Bambrick's defence offered no testimony, but wanted to express Bambrick's profound remorse for his actions. The sentencing was adjourned for a week, so Justice Paul Carney could review everything before sentencing. A week later, after a review of the evidence, Justice Paul Carney handed down his sentence to Bambrick. He said, given Bambrick's appetite for this type of sexual gratification, that he was likely to offend again. He also pointed out that this was not a one-off occurrence, otherwise Mary would not have died. Because of his age, a longer sentence would be required, as he physically would be able to carry out such sexual acts again when he got out, and so we saw him as a high risk of re-offending again. He said that while Bambrick was in prison, he would have a pent-up appetite for bondage, which would be fueled by other inmates in Arbor Hill, where all the sexual offenders are held in Ireland. To avoid this, a life sentence would have to be handed down. But this was not an option, as manslaughter had been accepted by the prosecution. Bambrick was sentenced to 15 years for the killing of Patricia and 18 years for the killing of Mary. Justice Paul Carney even went as far as saying that he would have liked to have given a life sentence each on the killings to ensure that Bambrick would never walk the streets again. 
He also stated that because he was convicted of manslaughter, he would not be released on licence, like he would have been if convicted of murder. This means that when Bambrick is released, he would be totally free and under no conditions. Justice Carney was not happy about this. He said that the two sentences would have to run concurrently, but no leave to appeal would be given. The family were not happy with the sentencing and was sure once Bambrick was released he would kill again. They were horrified that the DPP accepted the guilt of manslaughter and that it should not have been accepted. Bambrick, after sentencing, was brought back to Mount Joy to start his prison term, but he did not last long there as he was attacked by other inmates. He was moved to Arbor Hill, the home for sexual offenders. In 2009, he was released from prison for good behaviour and a flurry of photographers were waiting outside. Bambrick was placed on the sex offender register, which was introduced into Ireland in 2001. While in prison, he did not take part in any programme for sex offenders. In 2016, an Irish newspaper tracked Bambrick down. He was living under an assumed name in the inner city of Dublin. It wasn't long before his neighbours worked out who he was and they avoided him like the plague. The only people that are seen with him are homeless women. There was a strong implication in the article that Bambrick was paying them for their time and that his past is still part of his life. I know people tend to come down hard on newspapers and media, but they also do what the Gardaí can't, and that is let us know who is in our area and therefore keep us safe. I only have one photo of my mother, Mary. It is from the hospital the day I was born um, with my father, Luke. I look at the picture every day. I have the picture up on the wall. Um, and it's nice to have the, although it's the only one, it's nice to show the kids that, listen, there's your nanny, there's your granda, and there's your ma. My heart definitely goes out to the families that are wondering every day, is someone going to come through the hall door? Are we going to get a phone call? Are we going to actually be able to put closure in our lives and know they're not coming home?